welcome again to a philosophical lecture short of Professor Castleberry. Now we're going to do part two of the David Hume lecture. We're going to talk about the problem of induction. So if you haven't seen the first part, go check my introduction to David Hume. They'll help out a lot with this. Um, now, to start off with the problem of induction, let's explain what an induction is. Some of you who, stu who study logic in my class, we've talked about it already a little bit. Um, and if I was a logician, you would, you would say something like, an induction is um, any argument where the conclusion probably follows from the premises on, on instead of necessarily. Um, a way that I think about it is much similar, very similar to how Hume thinks about it. An induction takes past observations of something and uses them to explain something we have not observed. For example, in the past, I have seen that all cars have four wheels. Therefore, I assume that in the future, even though I've never observed this, all cars have four wheels. Or we see something in the past I've observed uh, it seems to be remains of bones of animals who lived millions of years ago. Therefore, I observe, or I assume, or I, I infer, excuse me, um, that there must be these animals, even though I've never observed it, that have lived millions of years ago. Okay, so that's what an induction does. It takes uh, observations of something in the past and uses it to help uh, under or explain something that I have not observed, to give us knowledge of something that is, to this point, unobservable. Okay. Now, the best way, and uh, one thing I really want to point out, the importance of induction and why it's such what we call a pillar of science. That's why Hume's looking at it. It is a pillar of science. Science depends on inductions and inferences to get what they do. That is the main tool or main quiver in the science, science's kind of, uh, you know, armor, armory. Um, and so it's very important. If we were to find out that perhaps uh, induction isn't quite as stable or as solid as we think, because what a scientist wants is to say that what I infer from an induction is knowledge, okay? What, as we'll see with Hume, ends up showing is that knowledge with a capital K, or knowledge as certainty, that it's absolute knowledge that we know, is something that actually is not possible with an induction, and he wants to show us why, which is a problem. If a, science, if a scientist wants to say their findings are knowledge, they can't really, at least at the level in which Hume thinks is knowledge, which, of course, we're in the modern period, since Descartes, it's thought that knowledge is certainty. If I know something, I must be certain about it. So what's the problem, Hume? Why can't I be certain that what is to come or something I haven't observed, even though I have to do you know, painstaking observations of other things, why can't I say that it's going to happen in the future? So let's take an example I think is the best way to show that. Okay, so let's say in the past, okay, in the past, all right, um, I observed, uh, or say in the past, when I let go of an apple, so an apple, it fell. Okay? In the past, when I let go of an apple, it fell. Okay? Or it fell. I'm spelling that wrong. Uh, it fell. There we go. Alright? And then I say in the future, or I'm saying about something I haven't observed, which in this case is the future. It could be the past if I haven't observed it. Okay? Um, the next time, I I let go of an apple of an apple okay. it will fall okay and let's say this is you know if we've been in stats class we have a lot of sample sizes I've dropped a lot of apples every time it fall it fell so the next time I assume even though I haven't done it yet when I drop it it's going to fall like in the case maybe it's the pin it fell. But now that's a past observation, okay? So now I'm saying, will it fall again next time? I'm then assuming, okay? I have to see why it's an assumption. Or at least I want to say that I know. I don't want to say I assume it. I want to say that I know that this pin is going to fall again. There it goes. But now, of course, another past observation. And so what I'm trying to get at is this time it's going to fall. How am I certain that I, that I know that it's going to fall? That is what was going on here, okay? Now for Hume, he says there is a secret, a second kind of premise that no one sees that we're assuming to go from this case to this case. And so maybe I need to make a little room here to show what that is. He says in all inferences, all inductions, there's always this secret premise. And we'll put it as our second premise. No one thinks about it, but it exists. And it's what he calls the uniformity of nature. Okay? The uniformity of nature. All right? Now, what is this uniformity of nature? So let's put, we will put it down here as the principle of the uniformity of nature, U-O-N, okay? Basically, it's the claim that nature is uniform, that nature is not freaky, that what happens in the past 
will continue to happen in the future. Okay? We could say maybe something like the past represents the future. Okay, or we could say nature isn't freaky. Freaky. Okay, it's stable. Okay, there's many ways to think about it, but basically it's this. The things that happen in the natural world now, or now it's now that, now that, that, now that's in the past, okay? The things that are happening just a second ago and any time before that, the way the world works then, the way it will be the way the world works in the future. It is stable. The nature is uniform. And he's saying this is an assumed principle. In the past, nature has always been like this. I assume it will continue to be like that. Therefore, then I get this with certainty that the next time I let go of the apple, it will fall. Okay? So this is an assumption. It may be a good assumption. But for Hume, we have to think how he thinks. Okay? Now, there are two ways we can come to know something like a principle of uniform nature. We have to prove the principle of uniform nature for this to be certain knowledge and induction. Okay? How do we do that? There's two ways. One is, Hume says, that reason could show us that uniform nature must be. And reason for Hume is anything that's a priori known. Okay? So his first question is, would it be against reason for you, the nature to not be uniform? For all of a sudden, nature to freak out and, you know, gravity not to work, we fall apart, all the things we expect that have happened not to work. And Hume says, no, it's not against reason. Because we got to remember, like I said, for reason, for Hume, it's a priori, or what I also like to put it as, it is what is logically uh, within, uh, reason would be, anything against reason would be something logically impossible. So we have to ask, would it logically be impossible Therefore, is it impossible for me to even imagine the world all of a sudden not be uniform? And for Hume, that is totally possible. I can easily imagine uh, things floating around and not working as they do, okay? Um, for him, we may think about, like, playing billiards. He says, is it against reason for when I hit the ball straight, instead of it going straight where I expect it, it shoots up in the air and flies across the room? He's saying that has nothing to do with reason. It has to do with my past observation. Reason is just what is logical and illogical according to Hume. So this is not against logic. What it's against is what I expect to happen. And when it comes into that level, so what Hume calls, um, what Hume calls relations of ideas, which he refers to as reason or logic, this falls under what he calls matters of fact, things that we have to know only, can only know through observation. And when we bring it into the world of observation, or for Hume, if you looked at my last lecture, the world of impressions of ideas, then that radical principle falls into place, which is there is no simple idea that does not correspond to a simple impression. And therefore, if we cannot find a simple impression that corresponds to our idea, the idea we have is a confused one, a nonsensical one. What Hume is going to show is there is no impression, simple impression of the uniformity of nature that I observe, and therefore our idea is a confused one. Okay? And how is that? How, how do we come to know it? And so think, so Hume would ask this, where do I observe? Where is my impression of the uniformity of nature? And someone has to think for a bit, and where do you see it? Okay? And well, what happens is someone eventually says, well, it's not like I see it right away, but what I do is I see it through a bunch of past events. I have observed, you know, maybe let's say, let's call this time one, let's say that's 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I saw nature was uniform. And then 15 years ago, I saw nature was uniform. 10 years ago, the same thing. Five years ago, the same thing. And then yesterday, Gosh, he's five, excuse me. The same thing. I take a look at all these past observations at different times. Things here and here, uniform in nature seem to be the case. Here and here, it seemed to be the case. Here and here, and here and here. Through my past observations, Hume, that's where I observed it. Okay? But now what I want to see is show you what he's saying. Okay, yes, through this event and that event, it's happening, but where do we determine from these separate little events that we have? Where do we draw from it that the uniform in nature is happening? And we say, well, from the past. Now, any uh, argument that takes past observations to explain something which cannot necessarily be observed, what do we call that? Well, let's write it out first, and then see if we can't tell what type of argument that is. So this leads us, okay, where do we come up with uniform in nature? It's not for reason. It's from past experience. It's habitual. So, like many arguments, we can write an argument like this, okay? In the past, okay, the uniformity of nature has been true. And therefore, I want to make a claim, not just about the past, but about all things, especially in the future. I then want to make this claim 
has been uh, in the past before nature has been true. Okay? And then I want to take that claim and I'll explain something I have not observed. Something you can never observe in the uniform nature is in the future, in the future, the uniformity of nature will be true. Okay? It will occur. Okay? So I go from my past experiences and all these different things about seeing the uniformity of nature, and then I use it to infer that this will continue to happen in the future and so on and so on. Okay? What type of argument is this? Well, of course, if you can't tell, it is an induction, okay? We come to know the uniformity of nature, at least on the surface, through an inference. But Hume has already showed us, in all inferences, there is a secret premise that no one thinks about. It is always a late minute. And of course, we've seen it over here. We will add it back in, that the uniformity of nature is true. And this, right away, should start bringing a few little problems with us. What's the problem? Well, look at what it says in one. The uniformity of nature is true. Two, the uniformity of nature is true. Three, the uniformity of nature is true. What we have here is a circular argument, okay? Or some of us call it begging the question. In order to prove inference, we have to assume the uniformity of nature. Now let's prove the uniformity of nature, so it's not an assumption. But in order to prove the uniformity of nature, we have to assume induction. And then, of course, to know induction, we have to assume uniformity of nature. But to prove uniformity of nature, we have to go back and prove induction. On and on and on and on and on, and we see the circle that's happened. Okay? What Hume wants to say is induction requires uniformity of nature just as the uniformity of nature requires induction. This is a circular argument, therefore a bad one. Okay? Um, some other cases, an example of circular argument, just to show you why it's not a good one, here's a really bad one, too. Um, so, uh, Everything I read in the Bible is true, okay? Therefore, God exists. Well, how do you know everything you read in the Bible is true? Well, because God told men to write it, okay? The point is, what we see here is to prove that God exists, we have to use the Bible. But to prove the Bible is an authority, you have to believe in God, okay? That's a circular argument. Now, this one here is one of very similar sorts. In order to prove induction, you have to believe in uniform nature. But to trust the authority of uniform nature, you have to believe in induction. And this goes on and on and on. And so what Hume has shown us that if certainty is the, the standard in which we measure knowledge, inference, which is the main pillar of science, is not knowledge. Okay? He has shown that science is not knowledge to its at least a capital K. Now, what does that mean for us? Uh, for Hume, does that mean you just throw it out, science out? No, it doesn't mean that. He says human beings are weird. Okay? It's not like we're just, it's, and this is what's what kind of weird about him. It's not like reason can show us this, and this is what's happening. But it's not as if we're just going to go stop using inference. Science obviously is continuing to use it, and any good scientist at least understands the problems of inference. Um, but and then what I want to say is Hume's not telling us, oh, to stop it. He knows we'll never be able to. Even himself, after showing this, he may sit in his armchair and realize this uh, if by thinking. But when he goes back to the bar, drinking some beers, he will go back to believing in the uniform nature and all those everyday things human beings do. And for Hume, it's not so much a problem that needs to be solved, but so much and go, aren't human beings just weird? We are a strange thing that, you know, we can do all these philo this philosophy and think about all these things and basically show us that many of the things we trust every day cannot really be known or be sure about, and yet every day I go back and believing like it's the case, okay? Uh, he's like, yeah, aren't we weird things? It's more that the human being is kind of like a contradiction, you know, in itself. And this is, I don't think, anything to look, you know, bad on anything. And also, like, you know, Hume's not saying it's a bad thing. Um, I think one of the things to get at is it's really good that human nature and its weirdness, okay, just kind of assume through habit the uniformity of nature and that inferences work. And it's good we do this, because if we have to wait until our powers of reason came along, we'd long be dead. If we have to wait before reason could show me why jumping off a cliff would lead to me dying, I might have already done it already. Nature takes over and fills in these gaps, even though there's no reason for it. And this is why Hume is, you know, is basically claiming we are not the rational animal, but the human being is the irrational animal. And Hume marks a very, uh, you know, a, a very kind of stark contrast of the philosophy before him and what comes after. And this is one of the main reasons why we take David Hume as being one of the greatest philosophers in Western history, and definitely probably the most important English-speaking philosophers there have been. So if you guys have any more questions about the uniformity of nature, please email me. If not, you can take a look at my other um, lecture. That may help you, too. Um, other than that, you guys have a good one, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.